with us this morning. Praise God. I want to turn your attention today to two passages in your Bible before you're seated. Romans chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, and then John chapter 8, verse 1, or verse 10 and 11. And uh, the bishop, like I said, will be back this evening, but we are thankful for his confidence to allow us to preach in the pulpit this morning. Amen. Looking here at Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges, for when thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doeth the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness, and forbearance, and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? I want to pay attention to that phrase, that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. And then chapter 8 of John Verse 10 and 11, when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And so for a few moments this morning, we'll teach on this topic, the goodness of God, go and sin no more. How many want to go and sin no more? Amen. It's the goodness of God that leads us to that and keeps us in that decision. Let's pray. Father, I love you. I thank you, God, for your people that are here and for our guests. Lord, we ask you, Lord, to speak to us, Lord, in the next few moments. Lord, I pray your anointing would rest upon the people as they hear your word being preached. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Praise God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. In, a, in the house today, there are people here with issues in life, things they're going through and struggling with. And it is not uncommon for people to come and ask for prayer, as we did this morning, because of their struggles. It is not uncommon also for people to stay in their pews and pray silently to God, and that's okay. It's okay to talk to Jesus and uh, just between you and him. I've done that. Uh, but there's something about when you pray a prayer of agreement with somebody, and you say, you know what, I need prayer for this specific need. Would you pray for me? The Bible says that uh, two or three, it talks about the power of agreement. That if I agree with you and you agree with me and we pray to the Lord, then we have a powerful team there. And so when we come into the house of the Lord, it is a good thing for us to be able to talk to somebody and say, would you pray with me? I can't carry this burden on my own any longer or I don't know what to do with it. And we begin to pray in God's peace and his answers come. And so we're thankful for that. That is part this morning of the goodness of God. In our text this morning, we have this story of the woman caught in adultery. The Bible says that Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him, and he sat down, and he taught them. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? And they said this unto him because they wanted to tempt him. They were trying to get him to make a misstatement so that either he would upset the Jews around him or he would upset the Roman governors in the area because of his answer. And so Jesus knew what they were doing. How many are thankful for a God that knows all things? He even knows the motives of your heart. And so the Bible simply says that he was quiet. He uh, stooped down, and with his finger he began to write on the ground. The Bible says as though he heard them not. 
Uh, I want you to know this morning, sometimes silence is your best friend. Uh, my wife tells me all the time that discretion is our friend, which means keep your big mouth shut. And so uh, and I found that to be true. I was reading through the book of James one day. Actually, I was praying. I was praying, Lord, give me wisdom, because your word says, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not. So I was praying for wisdom, and the Lord spoke to me in my prayer time and said, Look up that scripture. Look up that word discretion. What does it mean? And really, when you boil it down, that word wisdom simply means discretion. It simply means being quiet. Sometimes the wisest thing that you can do in a situation is not talk. Sometimes your talking is like fuel on a fire that causes it to flame and burn out of control. But if you'll just be quiet, there's another passage of the Bible that says to be still and know that I am God. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And so I have learned in life that there are often times, most of the time, when I want to react, when I want to say something, you know, I have been maligned or somebody I know I'm close to has been mistreated. I want to rise up. But if I would hold my peace, we used to sing a song, if I hold my peace and let the Lord fight my battle, victory shall be mine. But it's hard sometimes to hold our peace, ain't it? And so they brought this woman to Jesus. They threw him her at his feet, and they accused her of this crime that she had committed, and they tempted him. They, they were not interested in the woman. Don't you know that this morning? They were interested in only one thing. They wanted to humiliate this woman. They wanted to humiliate her, and, to, and they did that. I mean, how many of would want your sins to be declared, uh, declared publicly in a setting? Nobody wants that. In fact, how many have felt guilty about something and you worried, if somebody ever finds this out about me, I'm run. Okay, that's what happened with this woman. They found out her deepest, darkest secret. And my question, and many people's question has always been, where was the man? Where did that brave man run off to? He was gone. And so here she is lying at the feet of Jesus. And the reason why that they had done this, wanted to trap Jesus, was because just the chapter before, Jesus was somewhere during a celebration. And the Bible says, the last day, the great day of the feast, he stood and cried, saying, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Holy Spirit, which they that believe in him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. And then it says, Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? And so the Pharisees were upset because Jesus taught that the Holy Spirit could be received by people, and the Father was going to give them the Holy Spirit. And in re relation to that promise, that statement that Jesus made, the people began to believe that this is the Messiah, this is the Christ, and they in fact began to worship Him. And because they did that, the Pharisees were angry, they were upset because Jesus was upsetting their religious apple cart, if you will, and causing them problems. So they were going to trap Jesus in this uh, question that it looked like he couldn't get out of either way. And so Jesus simply stoops on the ground and he begins to write on the ground with his finger. And when he does that, there's silence. And um, he says unto them, He that is out sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. I, my pastor, when I was in Parkersburg in Bible College, Mike Seaball, he has on his desk uh, a stone, and it's right there in the front, and he, when people would come into his office, it would be staring you right in the face, and that stone has written on it, he that is without sin cast the first stone. And so people would come to his office and start complaining about this situation or that situation or this person or that person, and before long, he wouldn't have to say much if they were just mindful. They could just see that stone and realize, you know what, I've got sin in my life, perhaps, or I have made some mistakes and oftentimes people left that room without any kind of uh, word from him because they saw the stone and they went on their way. If he had replied to them that they were supposed to execute her according to the law of Moses, the Roman law would have superseded because at that time the Romans were in charge in Palestine. 
And so Jesus was being tricked, or they thought they were trying to trick him, because if he said, we need to execute her, the people had no more authority and power to do that, because at that time, Israel was in subjection to the Roman Empire. If he had also said to execute her, uh, according to the law of Moses, the Jews in the room would be upset about it because this is a practice that had not been practiced in some time. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing when he simply stooped upon the ground and began to write on the ground with his fingers. Now, everybody wants to know what Jesus wrote upon his finger. I'm not so much interested in what he wrote as I am in what he said when he stood up and said, is there anybody here that's sinless? Go ahead and cast the first stone. And then he stooped on the ground again. And you know the story that when they heard it, the Bible says they were convicted by their own conscience and went out by one, beginning from the eldest even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. The longer you live, the more you should realize your need for mercy. The longer I live, the more I'm thankful that God has forgiven me. I am just a clay vessel, marred, and there's things I do all the time that I need Jesus to forgive me of. And so I don't stand in the position of judgment or condemnation with people because I need mercy every day. I need God's hand of mercy up in me. So why would I want to raise up my hand against somebody else? And here's the thing, too. You don't know what that person's been through. It's easy to judge somebody when you haven't walked in their shoes. It's easy to judge somebody when you don't live in their home. It's easy to judge somebody when you don't understand the relationships and the dynamics that they've had or the struggles they have had, both emotionally, spiritually, or even physically. But if you would just mess, worry about your own mess in life and not somebody else's mess, you'd go a long way and a lot further in not just receiving the mercy of God, but seeing God's mercy displayed in other people's lives. And so Jesus, the Bible said, lifted up himself, and he saw none but the woman, but he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Turn to your neighbor and say, and smile at him and say, Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Amen. I... Do you know it's possible to live a sinless life? It's hard. <laughs> I have not perfected it, but if Jesus said go and sin no more, that means it's possible. Uh, thank God for the mercy of the Lord, though. And I want you to know that they brought that woman to Jesus to humiliate her. There is a great difference between humility and humiliation. Humility will always be followed by divine advancement because God's, the Bible says God resists at the proud, but he gives the grace to the humble. If you, if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, he exalts you in due time. There is a difference between humility and humiliation. Humility doesn't mean that you think, uh, I remember how to say it now. You ever get that thing where you're confused, something in your mind? Uh, you don't think of yourself, you don't think less of yourself when you're humble, but you think of yourself less. In other words, you don't think you're so great all the time, but you do think of yourself less in situations. You become selfless when you're humble. And so Jesus here is not going to humiliate this woman. He says, neither do I condemn thee. She's already been humiliated. She's already been brought before Jesus. Everybody around was standing there waiting to hear Jesus teach. This was the great teacher. This was the one that they saw as the Messiah, as that prophet talked about by Moses and prophesied by the other prophets. And they were expecting great and mighty things from this wonder worker, this miracle man. And here he is getting ready to teach them a lesson. They're thinking, well, yesterday he told us that we could be filled with the Holy Spirit. What's he going to tell us now? And as he's getting ready to teach them, here comes these Pharisees, these people that had appointed them as the police, if you will, of purity, of right and wrong. And so Jesus simply ignores what they say to him. Because he understands what they're trying to do. Humiliation is different because humiliation always leads to degradation. The enemy wants to degrade you. He wants to tell you lies about yourself. He wants to focus on these little things that might trip you up and begin to make you think that somehow there is something inherently 
evil and wrong about you so that you can never overcome the sin that tempts you. The Bible says that we are supposed to be careful of the weight and every sin which does so easily beset us. But it also says, sin not, little children, but if you sin. The Bible said, if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. God has made a way for you, even after you've been born again, to come to him and say, Lord, I'm sorry, because he doesn't want you to live in humiliation and in condemnation. He doesn't want you to live in shame. Instead, he wants you to, live you, to, you to live in victory and living in for him in a way that you will be always looking towards what you can do for him and not living in your past where you're lying on the ground degraded and wounded and injured. And so it is important for us to be in right relationship with Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. There is therefore now no condemnation. The Lord is not in the condemning game. He's not in to this idea of making people feel bad about themselves and putting them under his thumb where they can never get up. That's what humiliation does. But Jesus doesn't do that to people. He lifts the fallen from their fall. He sets us up on a rock. He takes us out of the miry clay. That is what he is about. And every one of us at some point in our life, and maybe even this week, needed Jesus to come along and lift put his hand down and lift us up out of that miry clay that we were stuck in, out of that degrading thing that we allowed ourselves to get involved in. That's what Jesus does. He comes along and he lifts us up. He lifts us up. That's why the Bible says he does not, he does not reject the contrite and the broken spirit. Your contrite heart, your broken spirit. He is leading you. As the scripture I read earlier, the goodness of God is leading you to repentance. Why is the goodness of God leading us to repentance? The Bible said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He is not going to condemn you this morning. Instead, He wants to lift you up. He wants to forgive you of those inequities, those sins, if you will, this morning that have been bothering you and plaguing you. And the only person that's beating you up right now this morning is you yourself and the accuser of the brethren. The accuser of the brethren wants to come along sometime and and tell you things about your past to try to ruin your future and destroy your present. But I've come to tell you today tonight or this morning that God is not in that kind of business. Bible says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? If you have been born again, you are God's elect this morning. There is no charge against you. It is God, Romans said, who justifies. God has justified you. You stand before him, not a man or a woman who has sinned, but one who has never sinned. Because once you're justified by Jesus, in his eyes, it's just as if you had never done it in the first place. We're not that way in our humanity we like to calculate and keep score and hold on to things. Somebody injured us, well, that's mark number one. I told a man one time, he made me mad. I said, I'm going to write your name in a notebook so I can mark it out. Because I was mad at him. Uh, that's not the way to do things. It felt good to say it at the time. But the Bible lets us know that if someone's going to come against you, don't avenge yourself on them. He's the avenger. He's the avenger. Amen. He is the avenger. He's the one that has the right to avenge you for the for the weapons that come against you. And remember that the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting away imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. You you think you're battling a person. You're not battling people. You're not battling flesh. You're battling spirit that are motivating people to try to come into your life and to destroy you. Those men that brought that woman to Jesus, they were being used by the devil to try to destroy the ministry of Jesus Christ. Do you remember way, way back in the garden where the Lord spoke to the serpent and he said to the serpent, uh, you're going to eat dust of the ground for the rest of your life, slither around your belly and all that. That was part of the curse. And a friend of mine, Brother Roe, who's not here this morning, 
he says that we're, ain't, we're devil's food. That's all we are because we're dust of the earth. We were born of the dust. And that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to use. He wants to feed upon you. That, what, that's the only thing and option that he has, trying to destroy you. He wants to spoil God's kingdom. So if he can spoil you, he can go into the strong man's house and spoil his kingdom, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's trying to do in your life. But he doesn't have that power today unless you give it to him. You have to understand that you are going to be able to leave this church this morning. When you arrived and when you leave, you stood justified in Jesus Christ. But you've got to know who you are and what your place in Jesus is. Here is a woman they bring to Jesus. Obviously, she is a woman of Israel. She is a child of God. She's a part of the God's chosen people who her identity then is wrapped up in who he is and who God is to her. And yet these men, they wanted nothing to do but to condemn her so that they could trick Jesus into making an answer that would cause Jesus to have problems. To condemn somebody. It simply means to punish them, to avenge them, to damn somebody, to judge or to call into question. Uh, we don't have the right to do that this morning. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm not going to judge you. I'm not going to judge you. It doesn't mean that you have a right to be mean to me, amen, to do me wrong. It just means I'm not going to judge you. I'm going to put you in the hands of God. Believe me, you'd be better off in my hands than in the hands of God if you do not repent of your evil way. Because God, although the Bible says that sentence on an evil work is not executed speedily, it's sturdily set in the heart of men and do wicked. And while it might take a long time for justice to come, eventually, if there's not repentance, justice will come. And so you want to be sure that you have made your calling this morning and your election sure. Uh, Brother uh, Uncle Mike over there asked if I was going to uh, bring hellfire and brimstone down this morning because he, he was worried because he had a bad week. I don't mean to bring that down this morning. I'm just talking about the mercy of God. That there is not, we don't serve a God who condemns you and wants you to stay in your fallen state and keep you down there. Instead, he wants to lift you up. He that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. You understand that Jesus gave them permission with that statement to execute her. He said, go ahead. If you have no sin yourself, go ahead. You're just. The law says what it says, no doubt about it. But if you want to do it, go and do it. Quit bothering me. And he gave them the permission to do it, not to show mercy, but instead to be judgmental. And they did not do it. They did not do it because they knew themselves that they were with sin. And so when we talk about the goodness of God this morning, we talk about that statement, go and sin no more. Jesus says, woman, where are thine accusers? And she says, they're not here, Lord. And he says, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. It is that goodness of God that leads you to repentance today. How many are thankful for the goodness of God? How many are thankful that he is going to lead you into mercy? You remember in the Bible the story of Cain and Abel. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4 this morning. As you're turning there, I'm going to begin at verse 1 for the camera crew upstairs. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought the first things of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth. His countenance fell. The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, thou shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, 
and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Here is Cain. Cain simply was bringing an offering to God, but he brought it in pride. He brought it not in humility. He brought it in his arrogancy. He brought to God what he wanted to bring to God, not what the Lord required of him. And the Lord didn't out and out reject Cain. He simply rejected Cain's offering. And there is a difference sometimes between that. And if you want to be born again, if you want to make it to heaven, the Lord is not going to reject you today. He didn't want to humiliate Cain. He simply said, Cain, you can make it right. Just do what is expected here. Uh, go ahead and do what's right in this situation. But Cain refused to. He got angry. He got mad because his pride was hurt. And the Bible says his countenance fell and he went out and slew his brother. The Lord said to Cain, he said, why is our countenance fallen? Why are you wroth, Cain? If you do well, you'll be all right. But if you don't, sin lies at the door. And one translation said that sin croucheth at the door. Sin is trying to leap upon you, Cain. And I'm here to warn you. I want you to know that in this moment, in this passage in the Bible, this is a passage displaying the goodness of God that was trying to lead Cain to repent. I want you to know that God is always good. He's always just, he's always righteous, and he's always calling people. God is calling all men everywhere to repent. And it's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he's always calling people. He is a God of mercy. He is a God who loves people. He doesn't want anybody anywhere to go to a devil's hell. But so he is calling people. It's his goodness to call people. It was his goodness to call to Cain. He didn't have to come to Cain, but he did because he wanted Cain to repent. He was being good. The father was drawing Cain to a place of repentance. So it's not God's fault that Cain did not repent. It was Cain's fault because he refused to do the right thing. Instead, he, re he compounded something upon another. It doesn't say that he sinned. The Bible does not say that, that Cain sinned by the offering that he gave. He just says it wasn't the acceptable offering. But where sin came, he said, sin lieth at the door. It's going to crouch unto you will be his desire. And that's what happens when we fall into temptation because every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust or his own desire and he's enticed. And the Bible says, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, once it's finished, brings forth death. I don't know what it is today that's got you tripped up, that you have been fighting perhaps for a long time, but I've come to give you a word from the Lord today that you can be free before you leave this house this morning. You don't have to live in that bondage and in that degradation, in that humiliation, because Jesus is here in His goodness today to call you to repent. The question is, what are you going to do with that repentance? Jesus is calling you. The Lord called unto Cain and said, Cain, just do good. And Cain rejected the word of God. And what followed was the first murder that took place on this planet because of a man that got angry and jealous. And he really retaliated against his brother. It wasn't his brother that he was angry with, really. It was his own self. And yet he turned it and he fell into sin. So sin will mark you. It will change you. It marked Cain. Cain walked around with a mark from that day forward, separating him from everybody else because of the sin that he committed. Once you know today, you don't want that mark of sin upon your life. Sin will begin to work on you. Sin will begin to, 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 to make edge its marks upon your face. The Bible says that the way of the transgressor is hard. How many have seen somebody that was in their early 40s or late 30s and they looked like they were 60 and 70 years old and you found out they just lived a hard and rough life? That's because the Bible is true. It says that the way of the transgressor is hard. Amen. And then I've met people who were in their 60s and 70s that had lived godly lives and had never gotten messed up and living out in the world like 
like, like they, they didn't, like others have done, and they look young because of their age. Somebody told me the other day I looked young. I told them it's not that, it's the fat that pushes out the wrinkles, makes me look young. <laughs> Thank God for, what is it, collagen, collagen, whatever they call that. But there are people that live righteous and holy lives. There's a glow about them. I love to be in the presence of the elders, the righteous saints of God, because there's a purity in their presence. And there's a youthfulness in their step, because they've given their heart to the Lord. And then I've been around people, we work, work around people every week, that are in the lows of life. They have made decisions that have compounded one tragedy upon another in their life. And they're 25 and 30 years old and they look like they're almost 50 because of what sin. That's what the devil wants to do. He wants to humiliate you. He wants to degrade you. He wants you to degrade the image that you bear. You bear the image of the Father upon you because you were made and created in his image. And the enemy wants to destroy that. Here is Cain. Cain could have repented at any time. He could have changed his mind. He could have done the right thing. Repentance is simply a change of mind, to head in a different direction. And God saw that Cain was taking a downward slope into what would eventually result into out and out sin. He was in his goodness saying, Cain, you don't have to live this way. But Cain did not listen. You have a choice this morning. You have a choice to either make Cain's choice and to ignore the word of the Lord in your life, to go ahead and continue living in humiliation and shame. Go ahead and keep on regretting your actions of the past and let it eat at you and keep you from peace. Or you can do what this woman did. Jesus said, go and sin no more. And the Bible doesn't record we ever hear from her again. Why? I believe it's because she went and she sinned no more. She heard from God. She obeyed God. She did what she was supposed to do. Same moment that Jesus offered her forgiveness, everything in her life changed. She stopped living in sin and she started living in repentance and in holiness. When you truly repent, a change takes place in your life. When you truly repent, you don't want to go to the places you used to go. You don't want to do the things that you used to do. You want to focus solely upon Jesus and live holy and righteous and godly. And so the message of salvation this morning is good news. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. How that Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, came to the earth and he was born of a woman and he walked among men and he taught and he made disciples, and he had a death, he had a burial, he had a resurrection. And then the Bible says that he was seen of people. That's the gospel for us today. We die out to our sins. We say to God, Father, forgive me. I'm not going to do that anymore. We make that commitment, then we keep the commitment. Then we're baptized in the name of Jesus, the name that's above Every name. The Bible says that that name, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that he is Lord. And then we are baptized. After a baptizing name, we come out of that water. We begin a resurrected life as we're filled with the Holy Ghost. And everybody in the New Testament was filled with the Holy Ghost, spoke with tongues as God's Spirit gave them the utterance. And then we're seen. That means you become an example to the world around you of the resurrection power of Jesus Christ, of changed life that you now have. You bear in front of people as they see you and they notice the change that's going on in your life. How many times have we heard the stories of people born again that came and they would say to people, What's, there's something different about you. What is different about you? Well, that's an opportunity at that moment for you to share the gospel of Jesus, the good news of what he's done for you. Romans chapter 6, we are called to go and sin no more. We receive the goodness of God. And uh, God has given us this mercy. Now, just because the Lord gives us mercy, just because the Lord is not one that any should perish, does not mean that we should take that mercy that comes from God and misuse it. It doesn't mean that at all. Look at Romans chapter 6, verses 15 
to 23, it simply says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness? But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed him from the heart, that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, you become the servants of righteousness. There was a time in your life in which you were the servant of sin. You were falling after the path of the devil. You were following his ways and his path. But then one day you made a decision. I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to take the words of Jesus to heart and I'm going to go and sin no more. No longer then are you the servant of sin, but you're the servant of righteousness. Then he said, Paul wrote, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. You have the right today. You have the choice. You can either fall into a state of iniquity and sin, or you can go ahead and make the choice to live in righteousness that leads to holiness. And then, for when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed, for the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You have a gift, a promise today of eternal life, but what you have to do is you have to let go of the iniquity. You have to let go and stop being a servant of sin this morning. Instead, be a servant of righteousness. That means that when the temptation comes or when the situation rises, you make the right choice. You do the right thing. Living right religiously is what righteousness is all about. That every day I'm going to do the right thing. It's not always easy to do the right thing. It's not always easy to take the, the high road. Some take the high road and some may take the low. And some they walk on those misty flats below and and they never come out of that degradation moment in their life. They live it over and over and over. But others rise up above it because they trust in the hand of Jesus to lift them up out of the miry clay. So this morning, you have a choice. Do you choose to be a Christian? Do you choose to be like the Lord? Do you choose to walk with Him? Uh, Caleb, Cain had his choice. Cain could have chosen to do right. Instead, he chose not to do right. And so the wages of sin, it's death. It is still death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's still the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. Even though it didn't look like it at the time, here's the interesting thing about the woman caught in the very act of adultery. It was the goodness of God that was leading her to repentance. Her accusers were bringing her for judgment. They picked her up. They brought her and threw her at the feet of Jesus. They made the claim against her. Was she guilty? Yes, she was guilty. Sometimes life gets so hard and, and you think that people are so harsh and, and, and it looks like nothing's going right for you, but God will use that situation to lead you to repentance. He was doing that with Cain. He was doing this with the woman caught in the act of adultery. The agents of her shame and her humiliation were there accusing her. These people that had, had, had go ahead and identified themselves as some kind of sheriff of righteousness in town. And yet here she sits, she kneels, she lays there with, I'm sure, her head down upon her knees upon the ground. And there's no way out of this. So Jesus finally says to her, woman, where are your accusers? And she says, they're not here. And he simply says, go and sin no more. So what looks like what might be the worst day of your life, the day that you got caught in your sins, the day that some people found out about what you did and it's mortified you, although that might be a very embarrassing moment, although that might be the moment that you are fearful of the most, it might be the best thing that ever happens to you because that is the goodness of God leading you to repentance. I got caught doing something when I was much younger and uh, I'd hidden it, hidden it away so nobody could find out about it. My mom found out about it. 
And uh, she came to me about it. Actually, she went to my dad about it. Well, let me rephrase. She came to me about it, and I compounded one problem on another because I did something that children do. I lied. I did not tell the truth. And so then my dad comes in the room. He says, who did thus and so? And I was a stubborn boy. It was the goodness of God that was leading me to repentance. But I was like Cain. I wasn't going to have none of it. And you know, for years, I dealt with that problem because of how I f- badly I felt about it. Because here's what really happened. I never admitted to what I did. I never, for years, didn't admit to it. In fact, my brother, who was standing next to me that day, he admitted to it. He got spanked for what I did because he was just tired of messing with my dad. My dad was saying, if you don't, if you don't, uh, if you tell me that you uh, did this, if you confess to it, I won't spank you for doing it. And he didn't spank him for doing it. He He spanked him for lying to him. Not because he lied. Here's the thing. It wasn't that he lied, okay, about doing it. He had never done it in the first place. So my brother was getting, and, and here I was in my silence, I let it go on. I was more fearful of that board, that board of education coming down upon my backside. And for years I lived with that guilt. My brother, and so one day when I was a little older, I, I went to him, much older I should say, and I apologized to my brother. I told my, and it was, it was way past any time for any punishment. But I didn't allow the goodness of God to lead me to repentance that day. And I dealt with, in my mind, always knowing I had done wrong, not just by my father, not just by my mother. I had done wrong by my brother. And sometimes when we don't do right by each other, it compounds problems. And it puts things up between us that causes conflict. There is to be no conflict in the house of God, not, not be that way. Is it present? Yes, it is present sometimes. I, I'm happy to say my brother forgave me. He probably forgot about it until I brought it up to him because he got spanked so much that it was, was one of many things. Well, he probably forgot about it years ago, but it stayed with me. That's what the enemy wants to do to you. He wants those things in your past to stick with you, to stay with you, to interfere with the relationships that you have with other people. But, but the Lord is able this morning to take your past, everything that you have been condemned by the enemy over, and he's able to take it and take it to himself and leave you standing here at this altar free and clean and justified before him just as if you had never done it. So it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. It's the goodness of God that simply says, go and sin no more. But what is your response to his goodness today? Is your response just to move on and to ignore it? Is your response to do like Cain did and turn it on somebody else? Or is your response going to be like this woman caught in the act of adultery? Jesus says, go and sin no more. And she went and she sinned no more. Are you thankful this morning for the goodness of God? Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We serve a good God. He is calling all men everywhere to repent. You might have some big, deep secret. It may be something small. But what you got to do is you got to give it to the Lord this morning. Offer it to Him. And let him have complete control of that situation in your life. Praise God. Would you close your eyes right now and just lift your hands and talk to the Lord?